Jewish Education and Media is pleased to present L'Chaim, a program that highlights the people, issues, and events of importance to the Jewish community. Now here is your host, Rabbi Mark Golub. I'm Mark Golub, and on this edition of L'Chaim, we are in for a very special treat. I have the honor of welcoming back to L'Chaim not just one of the most brilliant and articulate voices on the world you are seeing today when it comes to issues relating to the Arab world and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but also we're joined by one of the most dynamic and heroic voices to be speaking in defense of the State of Israel and especially the extraordinary ethic of the IDF. Dr. Mordechai Kedar and Major Reserve Amit Derry. Let me remind you a little bit about each of my distinguished guests. Dr. Mordechai Kedar is a professor of Arabic literature at Bar Ilan University in Israel. For 25 years, Mordechai served in military intelligence for the IDF, specializing in Islamic groups and the politics of Arab countries and the Arab media. And Mordechai Kedar lectured throughout the world on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and Arab issues. And Major Reserve Amid Derry is the founder and chairman of Reservists on Duty, which sees as its mission answering the charges of those Israeli soldiers who seek to berate and defame the practices and behavior of the IDF, and in response to these charges, to tell the true story of the IDF so that people will understand the extraordinary ethic and practices of the Israel Defense Forces. And Mordechai Kedar and Amit Derry are two of my favorite people in the world. It is spectacular to have you back. I thank both of you for making time for me. Thank you, Mordechai. Thank you so much for having us here on JBS. Uh, I love it when you're here, and Amit, thank, thank you for you. joining us. Okay. Uh, by the way, you're here now today on uh, L'Chaim JBS because you're doing some things together. Amit, how did that come about? Uh, like you said, we thought in Reservists on Duty who are the most instinctu instinctuish people to speak on behalf of uh, the State of Israel on, on, on the name, in the name of Reservists on Duty, and Moti is uh, definitely one of them. Uh, so we are here for an event uh, in New York uh, to get people know, to know uh, reservists on duty, and we, we asked for Moti to speak on behalf of... That's lovely. By the way, I already said you're a major in the reserves. Yeah. Are you in the reserves also? Yes. What's, your, what's your rank? Lieutenant Colonel. And what do you do? Well, it's uh, two secretary, but uh, just to be in general, I am an advisor to the Northern Command about Arab affairs. And I was released from reserve yes. uh, like nine years ago when it I was 55, but I was asked to volunteer. So as much as I can, I joined the forces who are usually 30, 40 years younger than <laughs> yes. me, but I'm part of it, it's okay. Well, Kolakavot to both of you. So you heard what Amit just said. He wanted you here. Mori, what do you understand the theme that the two of you want to express wherever you go? And you're, you're going to be speaking to three synagogues on one day. You're going to be speaking, where is the first place you're speaking, you told me? On Bernstein. Oh, yeah, Alliance Bernstein with Jeff Weisenfeld. What's the theme that you hope to express and, and to speak to? Israel has a problem which... People, too, too many people think, or tend to think, that all the problems of the Middle East are related to Israel. This is why if you search peace in the Middle East, you'll find that 90% of the occurrences is about Israel and the Palestinians. Although there are so many problems in the Middle East which are totally, absolutely nothing has to do with Israel. The problems with the Moroccans in the Western Sahara, the problems in Algeria, a civil war they had in the 90s, the problems in Libya, tribes are killing each other en masse, problems in Sudan, 
Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Turkey with the Kurds, Baluchis in, in Iran. Wherever you go in the Middle East, you see wars and bloodshed and, and, and what, you know, with misery, as you can see. Only one problem is to connect to Israel, Israel and the Palestinians. All the Arab problems are totally uh, regardless of Israel. Okay, but you know there are those in America, even inside the American administration, certainly who were in the Obama administration, who suggested that if Israel and the Palestinians could only somehow work it out, if there were a peace between Israel and the Palestinians, it would spread throughout the entire Middle East. Is that true? This is as close to craziness than anything else. Why? Arabs and Kurds are killing each other for millennia. Millennia. Israel is 70 years old. So what's the connection? Sunnah and Shia are killing, are killing each other for 14 centuries. Where is Israel in the 14 centuries? Okay, tribes are fighting in the Middle East from time immemorial like in Libya, Sudan, Yemen. So even if, if Israel evaporates, not even one Arab problem will be solved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's part of the message you want to get across? Yes, because the, 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 the idea that Israel is behind all the problems of the Middle yes. East actually undermines the legitimacy of its struggle and in sometimes the legitimacy of its existence altogether. So here we meet the message of, of Amit, and with his, the, the vilification of the Israeli army, who is fighting for Israel in order to survive in this most miserable area of the world named the Middle East. By the way, how's it been going for you? Uh, when you and I met on our first meeting here on L'Chaim, you were explaining to us that there were individuals and groups inside Israel. We talked about uh, breaking the silence soldiers who claim they are within the IDF saying that they are going to expose inappropriate, sometimes really brutal behavior by other IDF soldiers. And you created reverse reservists on duty, Israeli soldiers who come and say, first of all, it's not true, and second, we want to set the record straight. Has it gotten any better for you and for the issue since you've been doing this work now for how long? What, you, you for found a year it? and a half. For a year and a half. Have you seen any progress at all in your area of work? Uh, the answer is yes. First, in Israel, we've, we, we can see that most of the, of the Israelis today are um, not willing to hear anymore breaking the silence. Most of the, you know, the Israelis, left wing and right wing, everyone, they want to hear from uh, breaking the silence. I, I think we and other groups in Israel managed to expose uh, the, the blood libels and the, the lies and to refute them and to say, listen, this is not true. And we did it very uh, systematically. We took their testimonies. We did it one by one and s saying, this is not true. You want to know what is, why it is not true? We, uh, we will tell you. We will bring the people who were there. They will tell the, the true story. So. Mm -hmm. I think in Israel we managed to uh, take them out from the, from the consensus that uh, they had in uh, the past, uh, I think, last 10 years. So this is one. And the second thing is uh, they are here in the States. They have a representative here in New York that's going around from campus to campus saying, listen, the, uh, hand in hand with the, with the BDS, with the, hate, the whole hate system against Israel on college campuses here in the States. And, uh, you know, fueling that monster, the hate system, fueling it with, with so-called testimonies, with so-called facts. And this is all lies. So I think our mission when we are here in the States is to say, listen, we were there. We know the facts. We are here with our, you know, with face and our, we, with our voice. We are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, camouflage ourselves and, uh, like, like they do. They don't say who. Who said that testimony? When it was? Where it was? It's just a story, you know, out of context. And who uses that? The, those stories are the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, those bad guys, they don't care about, you know, they don't want to. They don't want to see us not in the borders of uh, 67 and not in uh, the borders of 48. They don't mm -hmm. want to see us. Mm -hmm. And they use breaking the silence. 
how do you react to the way he describes the problem? And does the problem exist in Israel as well as in communities, Jewish and non-Jewish, outside of Israel? Well, it started in Israel, don't forget. Yes. Uh, the, the science started in Israel, and they became like a, a petted uh, uh, boy by all kinds of people who blame Israel for everything which happens uh, uh, between us and the Palestinians. So uh, definitely, the second, second phase, they got the spotlights of the world, and money started to come upon them from the New Israel Fund, and for, for other, I, I believe that Arab money is also invested in them through all kinds of uh, organizations. George Soros. Uh, George Soros, of course. So, uh, w w and you know, uh, look for the money. Mm -hmm. when, when, you, when you find the money, mm -hmm. you fi you'll find the activists who will be <laughs> willing to, to act and to say whatever you like, only to get the money. Unfortunately, there are people who are greedy enough to uh, follow the money and to, uh, and, and to take whatever is given to them. But um, in Israel, as, as Amit said, they are all already in, in the margin. Uh, people understood what the bad role they play, both in Israel and then outside. And uh, we are sick of all those who are going around the world and tell lies uh, on Israel. We have all kinds of other organizations like B'Tselem. And uh, look, even Shalom Achshav, unfortunately, uh, took part in all kinds of stories against Israel. And uh, yes, and I must admit that once, like in 20 years ago, I thought they might be right. But mm -hmm. I, I discovered that organizations like uh, uh, Breaking the Silence and uh, Shalom Achshav, they don't make us stronger as they claim, morally or they actually are encouraging all our enemies to continue to hit us. Because when they see those invertebrates, they understand that if they press on Israel, if they wage more wars on Israel, more people will be like Peace Now, New Israel Fund, breaking the silence, and so forth. So this is why organizations like, like, uh, like uh, Reservists on Duties actually give Israel a, a, a better image, an image of a society which is willing to fight for itself. And this actually is what deters our enemies and actually will give us peace. Mm. Because peace in the Middle East is given mm. not to weak people who, who are nice and walking peacefully to the guest chambers. Uh, peace in the Middle East is given only to the powerful and to the invincible people. And definitely organizations like, uh, uh, like uh, Reservists on Duty give Israel the image of invincible because we are fighting both in Israel, in the army, and outside here in the, in the American campuses as well. So when you hear Mordechai talk about strength, do you agree with the, his characterization? And the reason I'm asking you is, while it reverberates with me, there may be people watching right now, Americans, American Jews, we've been taught a different ethic. The ethic we've been taught is all human beings are basically the same. They want the same for themselves and for their children. They just want to live in peace. And the way you make peace is by being strong, firm, but gentle. And there may be some who hear what Mori has to say, in, and they will hear it and wonder whether he is being too right-wing or whether he is describing life in the Middle East accurately. You're each of a different generation. I'm asking you, to what extent do you feel that Mordecai Kedar has articulated the reality that you as a young Israeli face accurately? I'll tell you. I think, uh, first I think, yes, we have to, uh, to, to be uh, very strong with a strong message. And I think the message is a message of peace. But when we are in the campus, we want to we, we present uh, the people, we want to show the people, listen, we, are, uh, we want peace, but there is a problem. There is a problem in Israel with the leadership of the Palestinians, not with the people, not with the kids, not with the women. There is a problem with the leadership because the leadership is uh, uh, oppressing its own people. 
So uh, uh, our, our, I'll, I'll, I'll explain how we do that. When we get on campus, we're doing like a, a day. It's called the, the, the Leadership Palestinian Values Day. On college campuses today, you have the, the Israeli apartheid week. A very strong, a very uh, outspoken. Uh, yeah. We thought, all right, we have to uh, think about something that is outspoken, that we can do out there in the campus and deliver a message of, uh, listen, you, this is not your values as an American. This is not, you don't want to be part of it. Mm -hmm. Why you don't want to be part of it? The exhibition is like seven different displays. One is terror, one is LGBT community, one is uh, uh, women rights, and you have one for religion tolerance, and you have one of, uh, 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 of uh, education. And the message is from all of the displays, it's very visual and, 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 and outspoken, is saying, listen, are you a feminist? You cannot support this. You will not allow even to carry a driving license. Are you an LGBT community, from the LGBT community? You cannot support this. Listen, they are throwing gays from rooftops. You will never see a gay parade in Ramallah or Gaza. Are you an uh, educator? I just want you to see that a five years old girl with a knife being taught how to stab Jews in the street. This is not you. This is not your values. And, and, and who is blamed is the Palestinian leadership who is, you know, violating, violating uh, uh, the, uh, the human rights of its own people. So if you want to be a, a, a man of peace, if we w and, and we want peace, that's the message. We have to, uh, uh, to understand who is, who is the, the, the combined enemy. And the enemy here is the leadership of the Palestinian society today. The leadership, not the people, especially in Gaza, Hamas. So this is our message, saying there is too much from, uh, from Israel, like Moti says. There, there is over-coverage, over-hyper-coverage of the, 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 the Israeli thing, the name Israel in the media. I say, no, let's speak about the other side. What's the problem in the, other, in the other side? And how we can, if we want peace, what we have to do and what we must understand. And my experience, we did it just recently, two months ago in Columbia University. And my and my friend experience was, you know, the, the, the American students who go by uh, and came to see the display said, well, I, I, I never see that. I'll give you just one example. I, I thought everyone knows that. You know, I I'm would too. Columbia University, they didn't know? No. I'll give you an example. I, I thought when I came, started with this with my friend, I thought oh, everybody knows what I know. It's the Middle East. It's all, all day. You can see it on the news all the day, even here. So when we did it on Colombia, I will give you just one example. One man, he's, he's learning political science. In, in five to ten years from now, he will be probably in the White House. And he came to the display, and he was, you know, stumbled like ten minutes on the display of education with the, with the five years old girl with the knife. He scanned the, pic the picture, and he, showed the, he, he, see, he saw the video from the official media uh, uh, education. Yes. Yeah. And he said, wow, I, I, nev I never seen that. I, this is my second year on, on Columbia University. The first year I, I, I was here, I, I saw the Israeli apartheid, apartheid week. I was so impressed by the, the facts. And I started to attend uh, SJP meetings, Students for Justice in Palestine. And I started to, you know, recognize myself with the group in a way. This is the first time I'm seeing that. I have a very hard, he was there, I think, 15 minutes, only on that display. And so he said, I have a, you know, we took notes and, uh, and our website and all. I said, I, I, have, I, have, I have some, you know, challenging questions to the people that I, uh, SJP members. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, to your question, we have to be, you know, stand out there in the campus, not doing uh, uh, preaching, preaching to the choir, and take a very strong stand for peace. Because this is the way for peace. Mm -hmm. The people of the world to understand what is the problem. And the problem today is not Israel, it's not the IDF. And I think uh, this is the message. But the question is why is the Palestinian leadership leading such a hate fest against Israel? And the answer is very clear. This, is, this leadership is illegitimate. There are people whom we, Israelis, brought in a minute of weakness in the early 90s to take care of Hamas and the Jihad without the Supreme Court and without B'Tselem. 
Unfortunately, we believed that Arafat will come and will fight our war against terror. Not for even one day he meant to do it. He took the Nobel Prize for peace, but did, did nothing for peace. And uh, the Palestinian rulership, not leadership, they're not leaders, they're rulers, today are actually ruling by force. Almost every day there are clashes in Nablus, not between the Israelis and the Palestinians, between the Palestinians and their own government. It becomes something like Syria, as it was until the eruption of the Arab Spring. It's like not being reported in the American media. Mm -hmm. because, because it's not politically correct. Mm -hmm. So the Palestinian, what is so-called the leadership, which is actually a rule, they, since they are illegitimate, as seen by the people, they must create something which will galvanize the Palestinians, the people, against a third party to show that they are actually with the, with the people and we have a common enemy and who is there if not Israel? So let's incite against Israel. Let's push the people to hurt Israel. So Israel definitely has to retaliate. So Israel will be the bad guy. Exactly what we saw from Syria since 1948 until the Arab Spring erupted. They used us as the enemy in order to unify the tribes, the ethnic groups, the religions, and the sects in Syria against us. The same thing is being done today in the Palestinian Authority. By inciting against us, by pushing the people to hurt us, uh, in order to show themselves, their leadership, as if they are a re real leaders and fighting the real enemy. And this is what is behind mm -hmm. what we see today. Okay. I want to know how each of you reacted when President Obama decided to withhold the American veto and to remit a resolution, 2334, to pass in the United Nations Security Council, which basically defined every single Jewish community over the Green Line, including the old city of Jerusalem, with the Western Wall, mm -hmm. all of the Israeli neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, the Malay Adumims, the Efrats, all of it to be a flagrant violation of international law. Mori, when you heard and saw it, what did you think and what did you feel? I was not sure if the knife is being turned around or straight in our back, but definitely I felt it uh, entering, penetrating my back. Definitely. Look, Gush Etzion. Jews were there before the 1948 war. And Jews were massacred in 1948. Uh, more than 160 fighters who fell captives, P uh, POW, in, in, in the hands of the Jordanians, were slaughtered by the Jordanians. Who talks about this? And so everybody talks about the, the Western Wall. The Western Wall is only the outside wall. We talk about the Harabite and Temple Mount. The Temple Mount where our <laughs> temple was 3,000 years ago. Where were the Arabs those days? Where were the Muslims those days? There were pagans in the, in the desert when we were there in, in, in Joseph. So now we have to explain to the world why this is our capital. Jerusalem is the oldest capital in the world. The oldest. What? Washington, D.C.? or Paris, or London. Jerusalem is the capital of the Jews is older than every other capital in the world entirely. So, and Jerusalem today is the only capital in the world which is not recognized as a capital of its own state. Can you explain such a discrimination against the Jews, which continues in this case, only because Qatar spent money on buying people and buying politicians, buying media people, and buying academics and, and the Arab boycott since 1948, and the whole world is shaking and shivering. Only because some Arabs are threatening the world with the oil. Will they drink their own oil? Okay, but what I'm saying is that the, the world actually is afraid of its own shadow by, oh, the Arabs are not willing to recognize Jerusalem. So what? Okay, but what, and, and this did outrages me. And outrage, it should outrage every Jew in the world. 
that his own capital is being under question, whether it's Jewish or not. Look at the UNESCO decision from last year. And Qatar bought this decision. Yeah, this was to And the next head of, of yeah. UNESCO is, is going to be a Qatari man. Okay. This is to define Jewish historical sites really out of existence and to say they were always Muslim, to give them Muslim names, correct? Look, according to Islam, uh, everything which Judaism ever had is lost. And Islam is the higher of everything, both Judaism and Christianity. Because Islam, according to its own view, is the only religion in the world. Uh, Judaism and Christianity are void, null and void. And so everything which they had today belongs to Islam. So, by the way, Abraham was the first Muslim, if you don't know. And according to Islamic message, Solomon, King Solomon, built a mosque in Jerusalem. So who are the Jews? But we know that's historically inaccurate. Who knows this? The we world know. knows it. The world knows it. Look, in the Middle East, you cannot disrupt people's theories with facts. Muhammad is born in the 7th century. Sure. That's fact. But the world was created beginning from Mecca. And the Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, as they claim, was built 40 years after the creation. But we know Although that's we know not it, true. It was we know it's not true. Sure. But they are more than convinced that this is their, their stories. Do you, know how the, the Do you understand how truth. frightening that is? How frightening it is to deal with somebody who sees or who lives in a world where reality is irrelevant. It makes one think one's in Alice in Wonderland, and, you're, and there's no way to make peace here. We, there's no way know, to go once, forward here. You, know you understand what? how scary this should be we to everybody? Name, we have you should, a name you for should, it. You should fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> once I, was, I, I listened to a lecture in the Jordanian TV. A lecturer stands in front of a class and tells them that the Bible was written by the Zionists after 1948 in order mm. to justify uh, the existence of the state it. of Israel. I've seen it. And, and, nobody, and nobody says anything. If I was in that class, I would say, hey, how come there are translations of the Bible to Greek from the third, third century BCE and a Latin, you know, the Septuaginta, the 70. Yes. And, and then the Latin translation, the Volgata, from the first century CE. Did the Zionists also <laughs> forge that, uh, those two books? Okay, so totally detached from reality. But you cannot disrupt their theories or their beliefs with facts. Mm -hmm. They claim that all the coins which we find in excavations in, in, in the land of Israel are actually being, being made by the Zionists. Yes, and this planted this. there. Okay, you've described how you felt the knife. Was it being put in directly Straight. or was it being twisted? twisted. Why would the American administration, under any president, why would Barack Obama do this to Israel when you would think those in the administration, those in the State Department, do have a sense of history and understand that while the issue is, may be complicated, the problem that is making, that is preventing a two-state solution a peace has nothing to do with settlements. And if tomorrow Israel took every settlement down, it would change nothing inside the Palestinian world. How can it be? What do you say to yourself, Mori, that an American administration doesn't, do they not know? Do they know and they don't care? Is it anti Semitism? What is it? What do you, when you and your wife talk about this, what do you say? Well, I think it's more of, more of uh, some of everything. It's a bit of anti-Semitism, bit of La La Land thinking, bit of being deceived. Look, I'll, 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 give you, I'll give you a good example. I met once with one of the State Department who is a part of the crew of the Middle East. And I asked him a very simple question. I said, look, you guys advocate the establishing of a two-state solution, a Palestinian state, in addition to the state in Gaza. Do, in, of course, in the, what you call the West Bank. Do you have any, any guarantee that this Palestinian state, which you so uh, vociferously uh, advocate, 
will never turn into a, another Hamastan, either by elections, as already happened in 2006, or by coup d'etat, as happened in 2007, and Hamas, when Hamas took Gaza over. Do you have any guarantee that we are not going to go to sleep one day with the PLO to wake up in the morning to find that Hamas took over the whole place? So he says, well, we didn't think about it. So I said, what are you paid for if not to think about such scenarios which are very possible scenarios? Someone in the State Department? Yes, in the State Department here in the United States. Not just the secretary. No, nobody of them, <laughs> they don't speak Arabic. They don't listen to Arab media. They don't read original materials in Arabic. They are not exposed to what happens around Israel. They know almost nothing about what happens there. And in, to, in, in my uh, judgment, they understand very little about, or they were understanding very little about the mechanisms of the Middle East, the role of religion, the role of history, the role of tribalism, the role of group thinking as exists in the Middle East way much more than, than what exists here. They think like Americans. They don't like, they don't think like Middle Easterners. And this is the source of every problem here in the States where people try and, and to, to fix the problems of the Middle East by using American tools or Western, Western Absolutely. tools. Absolutely. It does not work. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Would you say it the same way uh, that, as you see it, the values which have made America so spectacular as a social experiment just wouldn't work in the Middle East? Would you say the same thing? I think it's a group. Uh, first, I, thought, I don't think it's all over the Americans. I don't think it's all the Americans. I think it's a group that we call it uh, prog people with progressive interpretation of the reality. Like you will say now, it's, it's, uh, it's a dark outside, but it's a day. It's not about facts. It's a narrative. And it's, it's a narrative. And uh, you can see that on college campuses with students. People with a, a progressive interpretation of the reality, you cannot understand. And, uh, and my father used to, uh, he, he says that there, there is two crazy groups in the world. Group A is people that uh, uh, thinks that God talks to them. And group B is uh, uh, people that think that uh, you can negotiate with group A. So uh, I, I, it's not about facts. And this is the Middle East. This is the Middle East. And uh, about, about the, the decision Obama took, President Obama took about Israel in the UN, I th I th I, a very simple qu uh, answer. Uh, friends don't do that. Very simple and pure, uh, you know. And, and two days ago, we, ju we just found out that he, uh, that he also uh, gave $200 million. Yeah. It's a lot of money. <laughs> At the, at the same day of the inauguration or something like that? Two days before, uh, virtually two, the same time. It's the same time. Friends don't do that. Mm -hmm. And I felt, as a, as a simple man, as a simple citizen of Israel, I felt betrayed. Okay. You know, there are those who say the most important thing for Israel to survive is that it be both a democratic and Jewish state. Let me be fair. A Jewish and democratic state. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a Jewish state, but it also must be a democratic state. And there are people who say to you, the problem Israel faces is that if it does not make some accommodation for a very large Palestinian community which now resides on the West Bank, if you do not either give them voting rights and make them citizens of Israel, which would threaten the, the Jewish character of Israel, Unless you do that, the only way you can protect Israeli democracy and maintain its Jewish character is to create a separate, legitimate state for them. That's the argument now that John Kerry makes when he defended and justified the decision by Obama in the UN Security Council. You hear it from the liberal Jewish community. Their main obsession is making Israel Jewish and democratic and anything that threatens either of them including the democracy is seen as a way to undermine the very purpose and legitimacy of the state of Israel I keep saying again 
I have two people here of slightly different generations. I want to understand how you view it when you hear someone argue that. Does it resonate with you, or what would you answer? I think the facts, again. Uh, the State of Israel tried to negotiate, uh, uh, I think, uh, hundreds of times with Sharon, with Olmert, with Barak, uh, and uh, with Rabin in Oslo. We are trying, Paris. and I think Paris. Uh, but again, to Obama decision, it, it's very it's, uh, connected. Uh, what he did, he said, listen, you don't need to, to negotiate. I would say 67 borders, this is the beginning. Now we can negotiate even on 67 borders. It's hurting the chances for peace. So my answer is always, we are trying. We are trying to negotiate. There is facts that the Americans were involved in those, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, trying to, to do that. So yes, I, I, I believe and uh, I, I, I want to know that Israel will stay a democracy. And I know that Israel is a, is a democracy now. You can see that with the Arab population that lives inside the borders of, of the state of Israel and about the Palestinians. We are trying to negotiate. And we need the help of others, like the state, uh, 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 to negotiate with them. But negotiation, not a, a, a one-side decision like what Obama s uh, did just now. Democratic right. and Jewish state, Jewish and democratic, and you say? Definitely. Uh, we should create eight emirates for the Arabs. They don't want it. Look, they don't want also the occupation of Jaffa and Tel Aviv. That's right, they don't. So if I wait for them to agree, I will wait until the Day of Judgment. What should be done... By the way, you really believe that, don't you? Sure, I believe it. That all the nonsense, all the commentary, the bottom line is, there is a mentality which says Jaffa is no less Palestinian than Ramallah. Sure, they show it. Why don't we get that? Because we live in La La Land. Why doesn't the American administration get that? Why doesn't every American Jewish organization say that over and over again? Morgan? I'll tell you why. Because they go to, to Ramallah, they meet with Abu Mazen, or with Saib Arikad, and they know exactly what these men want to, want to hear. So they keep telling them the same thing. In Arabic, they say things which are totally different. But those Jews do not understand Arabic. Now, what we should do is set free like almost two million Arabs who live in the PA today, this, those who live in the cities. First of all, Gaza is a state because Gaza has borders, Gaza has a government, Gaza has a military industry and an army and police. And ministries and whatever a state needs, Gaza has. So if something looks like a state and walks like a state, it is not a duck. Mm. It is a state, first of all. Secondly, we have to continue and create emirates in the cities of Judea and Samaria, in the Arab cities, in Hebron for the tribes, for the clans of Hebron, the, the Kawasme, and Nache, and, 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 and Jabri, all those and another emirate in Jericho for the Arikats. And they have a king, Saib Arikat. He is the king of Jericho. And uh, uh, in Ramallah for the Bargutis, and in, Sh in Shechem, in Nablus also, for the Masri and Tukan and Shaka, the, the, the tribes. You know, once somebody from, from Nablus once told me that if an, a man from Nablus doesn't know whether to hit his wife or not, he looks up to the palace of their king, Munib al-Masri, and he gets the inspiration from there, and he knows what to do to his wife, whether to hit her or not. So this is how, to what extent this man actually leads, not controls, not rules, leads the emirate of Nablus. The same thing in, in uh, Tulkarem, Kalkili, and Jenin, while Israel should remain forever in the rural areas. And after all, it's our, ours, because it was given to us already in 1920 in the San Remo uh, Convention. 
So it's ours. We, don't, we didn't take it from anybody. We liberated it from Jordan. And this is how we should look at the thing. This is how Israel can remain both Jewish and democratic. Because maybe 10% of the Arab population of Judea and Samaria will be given or offered Israeli citizenship, just like the Arabs in the Galilee or in the Negev. It is not a demographic threat, and those Emirates can flourish and be like Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Kuwait, and Qatar. It's okay with me. Israel can give them access to the sea through Ashdod or to Haifa Harbor. They can have access to Ben Gurion Airport. They can have access to each other. They can make a federation, confederation, whatever they like. It's not my business. They can have access to Jordan, everything. And since I assume that it will be peaceful, there will be peace between them and us. And now they don't need any external enemy to unite them artificially as the Palestinian Authority wants, because this is the only way how the PA tries to build its own legitimacy. After all, it's illegitimate uh, uh, entity. So this is, in my view, the solution for everything, for the peace problem, for the Jewish prob- uh, question, and for the democratic question as well. All right, I want to ask you something totally different. I mean, you published a piece in Haaretz this past summer criticizing Haaretz for crossing democracy's most fundamental red line. And you wrote, Haaretz has shamelessly and selfishly demonized the country and its army, knowing full well that the hateful lies of its writers will be repeated by foreign enemies. You remember the piece? Yeah, sure. Okay. I want you to address, first of all, what was it specifically that prompted you to write it? Mm -hmm. How do you feel about it now? And then I'm going to ask Mordechai, to what extent does he believe the criticism you're leveling against Haaretz is a serious issue inside the State of Israel? Mm -hmm. I'll give you just one example that I will never forget. One article. Gidon Levy, he's a well-known journalist uh, in Israel and all over the world because uh, the bad guys are using his testimonies, materials. And I remember which, uh, this was the piece that uh, motivated me to, to write this article. It was the headline. The headline was, Israel is an evil state. It was like, for me, it was, what? What he's talking about? Israel is an evil state in English. That, that was the, the, the headline. And uh, when you look uh, out, uh, we are working and countering groups like SJP, Students for Justice in Palestine. They took a big picture, a big uh, display, put in that uh, uh, headline, like Israel is an evil state, and there is a signature down, and Israeli journalists, they don't care about Gidon Levy, Israeli journalists said that Israel is an evil state. Is the source, and then you go to the, to the article, so Israel is the source of the evil. You read that and you think, you think, well, we are in the 30s of Germany? What, what, what is that? And you go to Amira Hess articles saying that uh, we have to investigate if the IDF soldiers are planting knives in, uh, in, uh, in terrorist, innocent people's hands and then shut them, shoot them. So this is, not, this is crossing the line. This is not, uh, you know, uh, liberalism. This is not about uh, freedom of, you know, of, of the journalism. This is blood libels, pure and simple. Mm. And uh, most of the, the Israelis are not reading that. They joke about, about Gidon Levy, but this is written in English. All the time. All over the world. Haaretz is a Bible to many American Jews. And uh, yeah, for, for me it was uh, enough is enough. Israel is an evil state was the, my red line. And, uh, but it's not, ju- it's not just that. If you go to, uh, 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 to Amos Shoken, uh, the manager of, of that uh, newspaper, and he's writing an article, a big article, Israel is an uh, apartheid state. Oh, come on. Israel is an apartheid state. You go to uh, South Africa and try to compare Israel to South Africa. It's a joke. And he always calling to the other nations of the world, the, state, the, the, the United States of America, to help, come and help the Israelis. 
help them from themselves. And yeah, I think Haaretz is not an Israeli newspaper. It's a newspaper in the hand of the haters of Israel. And it's a fuel, literally a fuel, in, 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 in the hands of, of, of those hate groups and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's op that operate here in, in, the, in the United States. So Amit says that it's only a handful of Israelis who have that perspective. Do you agree with Amit? Well, there's a joke in Israel that once there was a general meeting of the Haaretz readers in a telephone booth. Okay? It was enough. For them. So basically you agree with that? Well, for the full disclosure, I grew up on Haaretz. Yes, you grew up a child. real liberal Jew, liberal Israeli. Left, you were a lefty. Yes, I was an activist in an organization named Netivot Shalom, which is the small and religious sister of Shalom Achshav. During the 90s, I gave peace a chance. Uh, yet I rather quickly uh, understood that it leads nowhere. And our enemies actually use us as some kind of a way how to weaken the Israeli society by spreading this peace uh, uh, culture as if, we, okay. as if we need it. Okay, and not how that. representative is Haaretz of the, Ameri of the Israeli people? Well, there are a group of Israelis. I would estimate them by 2 or 3% of the population. Not large. Not large at all. Okay. Who think like Haaretz? Okay. Now, Gidon Levy, look, I stopped my subscription on Haaretz when I found out one day that Gidon Levy, who is in charge of the human rights issues of Judean Samaria, that he doesn't speak Arabic. Now, he brings what Arabs tell, Arabs tell them day and night. This is actually what he's the subject. He quotes them, but he doesn't understand what they say. There is always somebody from the PA who goes with him and translates to him what these people say. Now, as a journalist, he has no ability to check if what they say is correct. Mm. This is not ju journalism. This is a mouthpiece of a propagandist named Abu Mazen inside Haaretz. This is what, so when I stopped the subscription, I was shocking. The publisher called me because he was afraid that if I publicize it, many others will follow me. And he spent like an hour trying to convince me uh, that uh, to, to renew the subscription. So I, I came with him to an agreement that the day which Gidon Levy will study Arabic, I will renew the subscription. So far, it didn't happen. But Amira Haas, as you mentioned, I salute her. Not because of her views, because she lives in, in Ramallah. Ramallah. She yeah. lives in Ramallah. She is not an armchair oceanographer. She really lives there. When we have clashes with Gaza, she, she moves to Gaza. And she lives there. And the stories which she brings are really from the mouth of the lion, inside. So, Gideon Levy, I don't accept every, even one word which we write because it could be lies which he cannot check. While what she is bringing has more of weight in my eyes. Of course, she's biased because she's a communist. She declared, she told me that she is not Zionist. She has nothing to the state of Israel. She's a communist. And uh, that's why, why she... Okay, so we had a politruk named uh, 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 Amir Haas with another politruk named, named uh, uh, Gideon Levy. And this is how it's, unfortunately. And unfortunately, people believe what appears in Haaretz. And Haaretz is biased totally against the government, against Israel, against Judaism. Look, they have another writer, Ogel Alper. Oh. Who, 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 who relates to Judaism as some kind of idol worshipping. I, I have to give you just uh, one example. We took Rogel Alper, Amira Hess, Gidon Levy, Amos Shoken, and others uh, articles from Haaretz. We did a one sheet, one sheet of paper. We took all the, all the most hostile, something like 20 hostile headlines of articles from the last two years. I, I don't know if you know that. Yeah. We took that, we printed something, a couple of thousands of copies. We go out there in the street, our reservist on duty, we go to Tel Aviv and uh, uh, Kikar Rabin and, uh, and uh, Shuk Machane Yehuda in Jerusalem and dis distribute it to people and interview them. We can give you the, the video to show your viewers. And uh, it is in English. It's in English. And we tried to, uh, to, uh, started to ask questions. The people, the people of Israel, what do you think? Where does it come from? 
what do you think about that? It, we, we didn't tell them that it's a Haaretz newspaper. I said, I don't know, some anti-Semitic anti uh, something. I, I don't know. Protocols. I don't know from where. Uh, and it was uh, amazing. And we tell them, you know, it's Haaretz newspaper. So what? It's an Israeli newspaper. Because most of the Israelis don't read Haaretz, mainly in English. So it, it's so funny to see it, how the Israelis themselves, not the Americans who believe, oh, this is a... This is, a f this is fact. This is an Israeli newspaper. The Israelis themselves, they don't want to believe that this is something that an Israeli mm -hmm. journalist wrote. So, mm -hmm. Speak to American Jews who go online and they, only, they need English. So you've got the Jerusalem Post. You've got a couple of things. But one of the things that, again, many liberal American Jews read, his Haaretz, and they believe they're reading a mainstream Israeli approach, which is a counter to the Netanyahu government, to a right-wing government, to, a, a, to an Israel which is not doing what it needs to do to create a two-state solution. Haaretz is read as if it represents a large percentage, perhaps a majority, of the Israeli people? Well, let me let me say something. Usually people consume media not according to what happens in the media. They consume media which they like to read and to listen to. Look, you know exactly what the difference between people who would watch CNN and people who will watch Fox News. It's not what they bring. It's we want to listen to them and we will never in our life open that channel. Okay, this is okay. This is why people who read the arts want to read the arts, want to see these things, because it enforces or reinforces their conviction, which is anywhere there. And this is why media serve not in order, not as change not to change attitudes, but in order to reinforce attitudes. This is why it's so hard to convince people that Haaretz is the mouthpiece of a small, minute group of people who are clueless, especially about the Middle East, and live in dreams that if only Israel does this, this, and that, everybody will hug and kiss Israel in the Middle East and, and beyond. And this is unfortunately the position which Haaretz brings. And this is totally, look, Israelis don't, don't take it. There are many. Uh, uh, paper shops, we don't even bring Haaretz. Mm -hmm. We bring the one or two. One, one copy or two copies. That's all because people do not read it. Even subscriptions and if, uh, are, are, are diminished. And if they didn't have Haaretz, didn't have a um, constant pumping of money from Germany, and I suspect it's not even money who comes from Germany. It comes through Germany, from other parties, like Arab world, I don't know where from, this is what I suspect. Without this pumping of money, Haaretz would go bankrupt years ago. So this is, unfortunately, Haaretz, in my view, represents other parties, other countries, our states, other states, other mindsets, especially the enemies of Israel. I don't have the proof of this, but this is what I suspect. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have a suggestion to our viewers? what they should be reading yes. out of Israel in English. IsraelNationalNews.com IsraelNationalNews.com Produced by? Arut Sheva. Arut Sheva is known to be on the right. Look, the struggle today is not between right and left. It's between right and wrong. <laughs> this is why Israel National News is on the right side. Mm -hmm. And I have there a blog of my weekly op-ed about the Middle East. That we use. What about Jerusalem Post? D depends who writes there. Um, I think um, Martin Sherman, Caroline Glick are good writers, prolific writers, and they have the good ideas. In other uh, Israeli newspapers, you can find Ben Dor Yamini, good guy with good ideas, and, um, and others, yes, definitely. We, had, we do have good writers, who write accurately. They don't try to portray a picture where Israel is perfect, which state is perfect. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is a difference between 
uh, stabbing Israel in everything which you say or trying to show the reality. Mm -hmm. Would you add any, or you think Mordechai is I th really... I think Mordechai is right. I okay. think Mordechai is right, and I think, uh, except of Ha'ar, it's in Israel. Except of Ha'ar, you can read, I think, and you must read everything. And the truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. But Ha'ar, it's, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's not about facts. It's not about what about facts. Ari Shavit? Ari Shavit tries to be accurate. Most of the times he succeeds. Sometimes he fails. Um, there is a, uh, look, Haaretz uh, actually uses uh, a fig leaf named Israel Har El, who writes solely for Haaretz, but uh, sometimes he actually criticizes Haaretz and Haaretz. And this, in this case, I must say that Haaretz uh, actually gives a stage for people who criticize Haaretz as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I once uh, wrote in Haaretz a whole page against something which was in Haaretz. They published it without editing it. And uh, yes, they, they try to show that they are kind of uh, even-handed, uh, but they fail to do it every day. Um, Israel Ayom also, uh, of course, Israel Ayom has its tendency to, you know, to support the government whether it's right or wrong, uh, but they have good writers there. Chaim Shai writes very nicely there. And even Yossi Beilin, who writes in Israel mm -hmm. Ayom, uh, has to adjust himself. So uh, we do have good writers in Israel that you don't have to read only Haaretz. There are uh, some other uh, media outlets uh, who, who write, you know, in their, uh, in their views. And, you know, every, uh, Israel is a democracy. Everybody has the right to have his own views. Yet those views have to be somewhat connected to the reality, not totally detached, as most of the writers in Haaretz are. Mm -hmm. Very often we read, not simply in American articles, but by articles written by Israelis, that if they're critical of Israel's settlement policy and of the prime minister, they are critical of the fact that Israel is building on, and this is the phrase they use, Palestinian territory. Modi, is the West Bank Palestinian territory? When was there a Palestinian state for it to be a Palestinian territory on one side? And on the other side, the Palestinians claim that even Tel Aviv is Palestinian territory. So even Tel Aviv, you know, once I was in, in a, one of the TV stations in Israel, and a very famous broadcaster told me proudly, my foot have never stepped on a settlement. I mean, he didn't, he didn't cross the green line. So I said, don't you live in the settlement of Tel Aviv? He says, what do you mean? He says, listen to the Arabs. So I says, who cares about the Arabs? He says, this. You don't care about what they say. You live in a la -la land. You live in a bubble. You live in a, in, in a world which you portrayed for yourself. You draw for yourself. Just listen to them. For, you, for them, Tel Aviv is a settlement, no less than Ariel or Gush Etzion, whatever. So, what we mean about settlements, even, you know, in, 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 the, in the Arab discourse, even the Jewish neighborhoods in Jerusalem, like Har Choma, Pisgat Ze'ev, uh, Givat Safatit, Givat Amivtar, all these neighborhoods are settlements. Of course. Settlements. Yes. Okay, so, excuse me, Set settlements? Isn't New York a settlement? When was it, uh, you know, it, are, are people in New York are indigenous to this country? In Denver, in Los Angeles? So, you know what, before they talk about settlements, on, uh, on the land which you can find Jewish remnants for 3,000 years, start to talk about settlements on this continent. Now, whoever talk about, talks about Israeli settlements and forgets about American settlements actually is um, a hypo hypocrite. What? Uh, New York is what? Was established before Jerusalem or Yafo? Yafo is mentioned in the Bible. Yonah, you know, the prophet? took a ship from Yafo, not from New Amsterdam or New York, okay? So, you know, modesty should also be kind of way of how to behave. Before you talk about Jewish settlements on the land of Israel, why, why don't you talk about European settlements on this continent, which are much newer than what we do there? Okay. While I appreciate the point you're making, it deflects. 
At the moment, the issue is, is Israel building on land that doesn't belong to them? And what the Obama administration is saying, what John Kerry said, what many of the Western European nations are saying, what the United Nations Resolution 2334 is saying is that when Israel builds on the east side of the Green Line, occupied as they say, they are building on Palestinian territory. And I'm trying to say to the JBS audience, that is a lie. It is sure. the big lie that the West Bank and all the territory east of the West Line, West east of the Green Line, never was Palestinian territory. And the moment we say it is, we're saying the land on the west side of the Green Line is Palestinian territory. Of course. Look, um, first of all, uh, as you say, there was no, no, never a Palestinian state. Now, in, for a land to be occupied, it has to belong to a state, to be so, under the sovereignty of a state and another state occupies it. The, what the so-called West Bank was never, was never under any sovereignty of any country, of any state. Jordan was an occupier there between 1948 and 1967. Why didn't they establish a Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as their own capital? Which they controlled. Which they could, which they could do. You know, 19 years they were there, like 7,000 days. They had 7,000 opportunities as they tell us today to do. Why didn't they do it by themselves, the Arabs or the Jordanians? So since there is no sovereignty on the so-called West Bank, it cannot be occupied by definition. By definition, it cannot be occupied because it doesn't belong to any state, just like Antarctica. Antarctica cannot be occupied because it doesn't belong to any state. Okay? So, so it is, legally, it is an area in dispute, disputed area. And there are many places in the world which are disputed areas. In Kashmir, between India and Pakistan. In Lebanon, between Lebanon and Syria. In many places in the world there are pieces of land which are in dispute. And this is the definition of the Judean Samaria. Now, every country which neighbors this area could have a claim, could have something. So, okay. Now, why don't they say anything against those who are blaming Israel about the Turkish settlements in the northern part of Cyprus, which was occupied by the Turks in 1974. And they kicked out Greeks to the southern part of the island. Nobody criticizes Turkey. Nobody criticizes Russia for what they did in the Crimean Peninsula. There are many occupied countries, and not to mention the settlements of the, of the British colonialism in the Falkland Islands, 8,000 kilometers from, from Britain, just off the shore of Argentina. This is not occupation. So hypocrisy, this is what it is. It's not occupation. It's hypocrisy of those who blame Israel for things which they don't, don't they blame themselves. How many colonies France has, Reunion and other islands, wherever they have, in Britain until this very day? Okay, the colonialists. And they look, look at us, people who came back to their forefathers' land in order to go back to, to renew their their, 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 their homeland, uh, with the permission of the whole world, after the First World War in 1920, San Remo. And now they blame us for get, getting back to our land. They set, did nothing when they were exterminated in Europe. What did they do those days? They closed all the harbors in the world for the St. Louis uh, 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 ship. And you know what? Without the closure on the land of Israel, on the Palestine, as it was called, by the British, there was a good chance that six million Jews were not exterminated in Europe if they let them go to Israel, as they should have done according to the mandate of the United Nations since 1923. But they refused because of the, the alliance with the Arabs. The British took a passive part in the extermination of the Jews of Europe. And yes, I say it clearly and loud. Because if they opened the shores to Jewish immigration, to Jewish refugees from Europe, maybe Hitler would not exterminate them. The British, shame on the British until this very day. Mm -hmm. Forever. 
I want to add something, I think, to the viewers. I think if you want to, as an American and even as an Israeli, you want to understand more uh, um, the, 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 the dispute with the Palestinians, you, have, you just have to watch education programs of the official media in the Palestinian society. Not, not the Hamas, I'm talking about the PA. Uh, just see education programs to uh, five, six, seven years old uh, uh, children. You just have to see, watch that. The, how they're being taught uh, they want to come back to Jaffa and Tel Aviv and Haifa. How they're being taught to, uh, about terror, to stab Jews. Five years old girl with a knife shouting, stab, stab, stab. And it's all over the place. You just have to Google it. And I think this is, for me as an Israeli, for, for me as a, a 10 years in the army, familiar with, you know, with the Middle East, with the facts, with the reality. For me, it was, I think, one of the of the landmarks in my, in my uh, uh, you know, uh, agenda to see that and to understand, oh, wow, this is a big problem. This is not it. The incitement that the, 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 the young generation uh, uh, being taught on, on television, on, on, educated. On, on, on educated, on schools, this is, um, if they will not stop with this, the, it's impossible. That's I know for sure. It's impossible to uh, negotiate or to uh, get an, uh, you know, some kind of an agreement. When the Oslo agreements were, were signed, uh, they immediately started, you know, the ministries of education and so forth. And like in 1994, when I was still in the army, uh, we once met with Palestinians and uh, we asked them, how come your books do not, do not show Israel, you know, on the map, only Palestine? So look, these are Jordanian books. We didn't yet uh, publish new books, we, we are still using the old uh, books of the Jordanians. Okay, look at the books today, 20, more than 20 years, books which were published by the Palestinian Authority. Do not mention Israel. The maps, Israel is not on the maps. And now they don't have this fig leaf of the Jordanians to hide behind. Okay, now they, so it was stories which they told everybody and uh, now they take the American money and they, and they publish books without Israel. Mm -hmm. This is what the American taxpayer wants. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, look, and there is another atrocity there, the UNRWA problem, the United Nations Relief and Work Agency, uh, which actually perpetuates war and misery rather than solving it by perpetuating the, the, the refugee problem. And though, look, even those refugees, those who were left Israel, were chased out, I don't know. They, many of them carry names which testify that they are not originally from Palestine. Al-Horani, means from Syria, the Horan area. Al-Sorani, uh, from Tzor, Tyre, in Lebanon. Al-Masri, Masarwa. All these, uh, Masharka, Masharka is from the eastern part of, of the Jordan. So all these names which Palestinians uh, have, actually testify that they are not originally from Palestine. They immigrated to, to the land of Israel in order to work in Jewish farms, Jewish kibbutzim, Jewish moshavim, and moshavot abaron, of course, which were Rishon um, Etzion, Zichon Yaakov, all those. They came because of all the, all the more jobs, just like they immigrate today to Europe. So because they came to Europe, now they claim they are Europeans. So they came, they came to Palestine, so they now they became Palestinians all of a sudden. So this is why. They, they went to their original places, but the countries, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, decided to keep them in refugee camps. And now they cry to the world, we have to feed them. So the world, until this very day, feeds them and, and straighten their teeth as well. Uh, teeth as well. So this, and, and they perpetuate almost 70 years. There is not a, another, there is no other group in the whole world which, support, which is supported for 70 years by the United Nations only to preserve the problem, in order to perpetuate the hatred in the schools which the United Nations, funded by the United States of America, builds in, uh, for, for the refugees, to pour more oil on the hatred against Israel and to produce more jihadists. So this is actually how, unfortunately, American money is used in order to incite against Israel, and in order to create jihadism against Israel in those schools of UNRWA, which are used in Gaza, for example, as a place to launch missiles. 
against us, thinking that we will not bomb a school because of the children. It means they use the children as human shields. Okay, so this is something which nobody asks any question here in the States. Maybe uh, some, somebody on Capitol Hill started to ask questions. This organization, UNRWA, should be gradually, so three, four years, should be dismantled totally. And those people should become, wherever they are, repatriated wherever they are. They live anywhere for 70 years, they're only three generations. So what, do you, what would they expect? to go to a place which they are not originally from. You know, I support the right of return. Return of the Masri to Egypt, because Masri means Egyptian. The return of the Horanis to the Horan. Return of the Soranis to Tyre. Tarabulsis to Tripoli in, in Lebanon. Yes, I am for the right of return, totally. I, w I want to connect that issue, that subject of the refugees the Palestinian refugees to, what, uh, to, to the activism that the Jewish groups doing on campus today, the main demand or the first demand of the BDS movement, all those, all, all of those uh, hate uh, uh, movements, are the right of return. This, they're always trying to plant that idea in the heads of the, the average American student. We have to let the Palestinians return to the, the lands, and they know that this will be the end of the state of Israel. The minute that eight or twelve, you know, there is a lot of numbers around. So eight or million, eight million uh, 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 refugees will come back from Syria, Lebanon. So-called refugees. Yeah, so-called refugees from uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, uh, Jordan will come back to Israel. That will be the end of Israel. So uh, that's what they do, and that's what they spread on college campuses here in the states. Yes, I am convinced that the BDS movement is an attempt not to make Israel better. It's an attempt to destroy the state of Israel, to delegitimize it with one intention. There are people who believe that Israel was built on Palestinian land, land that belonged to other people, and that as tragic a situation as world anti-Semitism was, which culminated in the Shoah, but really anti-Semitism mm -hmm. predates the Holocaust. Yeah. At the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, Jews were facing horrible persecution, anti-Semitism. They were getting killed. Yes, it's a ter terrible thing, people say. But what right did the world, the world, the, did the League of Nations have to say, there's a Jewish problem, and the Arab world should take the problem. We will put the Jewish state in the Arab world. But I just received an email from somebody who said to me, this problem will never be solved. Maybe it's time to move Israel somewhere else. I'm saying to myself, this is a Jew who doesn't understand. Israel wasn't put somewhere strange. It wasn't put in an Arab world. It's a region. It was put, the Jews came home. And there was plenty of home to come to. And the Jews said to the Arab, you're welcome to live here. Just live here as a Ger Toshav. Don't try to kill me. You want to be a citizen? We'll make you a citizen. You'll have voting rights. You'll have a very social right. Are we a perfect society? No, you said that. Who's perfect? America perfect? Nobody's perfect. But the goal is you're an Israeli citizen. We don't care if you're Arab. We don't care if you're Druze. We don't care if you're Christian. You're, you're an Israeli. But don't kill us and don't try to destroy us. And I'm convinced that the BDS world believes and that they're young people, well-meaning people, who think that the world dropped Israel into an Arab neighborhood and said to the Arab, get out. The Jews have nowhere to go, so it's your bad luck. And that Israel is fundamentally illegitimate. And I'll say one last thing to you. And the audience has heard me say this many times. Ari Shavit is a fabulous journalist, and he wrote a wonderful book called My Promised Land. But the cradle of that book is expressed in the first chapter, where Ari Shavit says, my grandfather came to Palestine as an emissary for Theodor Herzl to look at the land and see whether this land was really good to be the home for the Jewish people. And my grandfather, Ari Shavit says, 
was so enamored, so taken by the land, by the Jewish narrative, he didn't see there was a people there. He didn't see there was an Arab community, people there. And if my grandfather had seen, says Ari Shavit, if he had seen, my grandfather would have turned back because my grandfather was a moral person. And what my grandfather would have said was, I'm sorry, the land belongs to someone else. Now that's Ari Shavit, who believes in the state of Israel for himself and his daughter, but also believes the state of Israel was built on a land that belonged to a different people, and the state of Israel destroyed that people and took their land. And Ari Shavit says, listen, we had to do it. But he is telling us, Moti, that the state of Israel is built on someone else's land. And that's what young people who are attracted to the BDS movement believe. And that's what BDS is all about. BDS is really about Plain on emotions. you had no right to be here in the first place. And the only way you will ultimately do something just is to take Israel out. The Jews yeah. should go to Uganda. The Jews should go to somewhere in Utah. And that's... And this is better? Utah belongs to the Red Indians. I understand. I understand. But you know what I mean. No, and, thi and this is what BDS is preaching. This is what the two of you are up against. Look, people who do not feel that they came to their forefathers' land by coming to Israel have definitely a problem. People who do not listen to the Hebrew talking from the land, the excavations, the coins, the mosaics. People look at Jerusalem as an Arab city. People who are oblivious of the Jewish history can talk like this, to say that we Jews took other people's land. But people who are aware of their own history, people who are aware of their own rights, people who are aware of their own entity as Jewish people, who were dispersed without any sin, who were sent to exile 19 centuries ago and prayed to, the, to, to Jerusalem, longed for Jerusalem. Jerusalem and Eretz Israel was part of their entity for 19 centuries. We remained loyal to the country. For those who remained loyal to the country, they have nothing to be ashamed of when they go back to the country. Okay, there are Arabs, let them live with us. We have 20%. 20% of Israel are Arabs, and most, most of them are Muslims. And Israel still is democracy. Still a democracy. How many Muslims are in the States? 5%, not even. We have 20, and we live with them. And I'm part of it. Half of my students in the Arabic department of bar Ilan are Arabs. And we sit together in the class, and we discuss problems between Jews and Arabs on the table. We don't hide anything. About, they complain about discrimination, it's okay. We complain about terrorism, it's okay. And we speak to each other, whether in Arabic or in Hebrew, because it's the Department of Arabic. And we, okay, we, we live with each other. We don't fight each other every, every day. Okay, we, we have here and there with problems. Which country doesn't have problems? Even in America, with a melting pot. Do they have problems with Afro-Americans and others? Okay, but in general, Israel is a democracy normal, with 20% people, of Muslims most are Muslims, and, and, they, and they live with us. We could live with more. It means if those Arab six states did not invade Israel, one day after it was established, the, the Lebanese army and the, the Iraqi and the Syrian and the Jordanian and the Egyptian and the Saudis, and the Yemenite as well, if they did not in, invade Israel, there was no war, there were no, were no refugees. And we would live there as we live today. But the Arabs are responsible for that war, for the invasion. On the 16th of May of 1948, we invited them. We wanted that war. 
a whole percent of the Jewish population of that time got killed in that war. 6,000 people uh, got killed. Jews were, were, were killed after the Holocaust, three years after the Holocaust. Yes, we continued to sacrifice ourselves in order to save our nation. Okay? But this war was forced upon us by the, uh, by the Arabs. And now they say that we are, we, we are to be blamed for this. We created the refugee problem. They called from the radio. Then the British actually uh, uh, write in their DA, in the, the daily, the daily uh, um, um, uh, news which they, they wrote, the British. They heard in the Arab radio stations that they call upon the Arabs to leave Israel for two or three weeks until they get rid of the Jews. Okay, these two or three weeks are still there. And they are still waiting for these two three weeks to, to, to end. Okay, so who is responsible for this? Israel is responsible for this? They are responsible for this. Let them deal with the problem. Let them absorb back the people who came originally from their own countries. In Lebanon, in Jordan, and other places which they emigrated to the land of Israel to work in Jewish places. So th this is the problem, that they actually deceive other people. Now, don't forget that we absorbed, we in Israel absorbed 900,000 Jews who came from Arab countries, Morocco, Yemen, Syria, Iraq, wherever they were. We received, and the, we don't have refugee camps. They were absorbed in the, in, in the, in the community. Okay, they're, they're everywhere. We, because we did not profess the refugeehood unlike them. And this is, this is the difference. We came back to our land. This is why we don't call them refugees. We call them olim. Olim, not refugees, means people who come up back to the country because we changed the mindset. And look, Israel and the Zionist uh, uh, organization is actually not only about taking Jews out of exile. It's about taking exile out of the Jews means that we are not refugees anymore. We are not running away from place to place, from pirates here and pirates there. We came back to our forefathers' country in order to build ourselves there from everyone who came from all over the world, from Yemen and from Poland and from the United States and from Afghanistan and from Morocco and wherever they came because they came back to their, to their forefathers. It couldn't work if they, did all, if they did not all believe that Israel belongs to them. The land belongs to them. And this is why it works. And this is why our neighbors, the Arabs, hate us because they envy us. Because we succeeded exactly where they failed. Because they failed to, to forge a nation, an Arab nation, from Morocco in the east to Iraq in the, in, from Morocco in the west to Iraq in the east, from Syria in the north to Yemen in the south. They are fighting each other according to tribal issues and sectarian issues and religious issues. While we Jews are living together, we succeeded to galvanize our, the dust of Jews who came from the ashes of Auschwitz, from the, wherever they came from as individuals with a shirt, nothing more than a shirt. And we became a democratic country. We became part of the OECD, the, one of the most prosperous countries in the world, the economies in the world, the high tech. The okay, we are a miracle. We are a miracle. And this is why our neighbors hate us, because they envy us. Because we succeeded exactly where they failed to turn their places into heaven as we did. They, 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 live in, they live in hell. And if Israel would open the borders, within one day, 100 million Arabs would come to Israel. Apartheid state. Okay, as they say, they will come to Israel in no time. Only because Israel is a story of success, while they are all stories of failure. And this is why they want to get rid of us, because we are the mirror which they see themselves by. How much do I love you? Thank you. <laughs> you understand, you're sitting in a chair named for you. That's your chair. Thank you. Every time you're in the United States, that's your chair. It belongs to you. People come on L'chaim, they sit in the Mordechai Kedar chair. Kol tu Thank you You go much. from strength to strength. It is so important that we all hear everything you say. You will always have a voice with Thank me you. on Thanks JBA. Thanks to you. Thanks to you. And you, my friend. Thank you. You're a chugibor. 
you know, Yasha Koch, for all the work you do, you're a very important voice. And it's not just reservists on duty, it's you and your soul. Thank and you, you too. Much. Anytime you want to be, you, and you, you come here to America, you've got to make sure you and I are together. But I wish you, you also go to Both of you. Just Thank you very much. magnificent. You know, same in a cloud. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Dr. Mordechai Kadar, Major Reserve, Amit Derry. Oh boy. Just fabulous. Just fabulous. Um, you may not agree with everything you've heard Mori say or Amit say. So be in touch with me. As always, I invite you to email me, write me, post on our Facebook page, tweet me. I would love to hear anything you have to say. And if you want to be in touch with either Mordechai Kadar or Amit Derry, you email me and I will pass your emails on to them. They are doing, each in their own way, extraordinary work, not simply for the State of Israel, but for the Jewish people in Klal Yisrael. I am honored every time they sit with me at this table, and they honor you as well. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. L'chaim, my friends, to life. be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.